Okay, folks, if you're just joining us, uh, we're planning to start at about uh, in another one or two minutes. Um, and so uh, uh, just keep in mind that the chat window is going to be your primary way to ask questions because of how many people that we have. So, uh, and we'll be starting here momentarily. And also suggestions and ideas as you hear us speak um, and know people we, need, we should be connecting with. Uh, that would be fantastic. Resources we should be connecting with. Yeah, I think um, Sarah and I had actually planned to do this session in person in Oxford at the Skull World Forum, and we we're expecting to get hopefully ten people over lunch to to to, to brainstorm about this this new initiative. Um, and instead, we get you know at least a hundred of our closest friends. And I think that's the great thing about doing the Skull World Forum virtually is that it can be a lot more inclusive, a lot more accessible to a lot more people. And so, uh, unfortunately, that means that we're probably going to do probably more talking at you, but we're going to have at least three different opportunities for you to ask questions. And the questions are going to come to us through the, through the chat window. So chat to everyone, um, because Sarah and I can't reliably be counted on to be always looking at the chat window while we're talking. But Manon and Steve, who are our co-hosts, are going to be watching the Everyone text channel, gathering your questions, and then actually at the three places where we have time for questions, uh, they're going to be basically pitching you your questions or a synthesis of your questions. So keep the chat window in mind as we're, uh, as we're going about this. So let's see, we're at, we're at two minutes past the hour. We're at 115 people and it's ticking up. Um, and uh, the question is, will the recording be made available? Yes, that's our, our assumption is that we're going to make this recording available under a Creative Commons uh, license so that more people can get their hands on this uh, because although it's the sun is coming up here in California um, it's not always going to be the most convenient time for everybody else in the rest of the world so um, and uh, so I think that we're I don't know what do you think Sarah are you feeling feeling ready to to do this let's go okay so I wanted to welcome everyone to our session on 1000 landscapes for 1 billion people a radical collaboration and we have a senior person from the Skoll Foundation who's going to welcome us today. So Shivani, do you want to give us a few words of wisdom from Jeff and Don and the larger Skoll community? Yeah, happy to. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Great. Well, welcome to the Virtual Skoll World Forum. As Jim mentioned, um, this was definitely not our original plan. Our plan was to be, as we do every year, to gather in Oxford. Um, for the Skull World Forum, which takes place each spring. Um, and this year we had to cancel, um, but we took it as an opportunity to lean in and pivot quickly, um, responding to our community members who said, hey, let's still meet up, let's do something. And so this is a um, testament to all of you. We have over 100 events this week. Um, the forum's theme this year was Collective is Collective Strength. And I think this is really representative of of that so it's really great to see how much um you all have sort of taken this opportunity to connect um and we're really excited about that uh and to have this event hosted by eco agricultural partners and tech matters um i wanted to just alert you to two things one is that as you're uh planning to join events this week uh, virtually please use the hashtag goal goes virtual um, so that you can follow along and also others can follow along to the content here. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is that we are still doing our Skull Awards ceremony and that will be broadcasted on Thursday, April 2nd at 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'll send a link and I'll add it to the chat window. Um, I'm really looking forward to the session and just wanted to welcome you all and um, yes, have a great week. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Shivani. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and frankly, we appreciate the platform that Skull has given us. I don't think if Sarah and I had just thrown a, thrown a session, we might have gotten quite so many people to show up. So I think that's one of the benefits. So, um, so uh, I'm Jim Fruchterman. I'm the founder and CEO of Benetech, which is a Skull award-winning organization, uh, and now the head of Tech Matters. Um, and my co-host uh, for today is Sarah Scher, uh, the founder and CEO of Eco Agriculture Partners, and she'll actually be starting off our presentation, but I'm going to give you some more background information before we actually get 
you know, formally into Sarah's presentation. So, and I know some people have actually heard me say some of these things before, but I'm going to say them again for the people who are just arriving. Um, so this is, we're obviously doing this on Zoom and uh, the chat window is the place where you can share your thoughts, share your feedback to us and ask questions. We're going to have at least three opportunities to ask questions during this session. Um, those questions are going to be curated by our colleagues uh, Manon and Steve. Um, and so send it to the Everyone channel because if you send it privately to, um, to Sarah and I, we might miss it because um, we're going to be busy talking, hopefully not too much, but yeah, pretty much. Um, and so, and so, um, so, uh, so at the right moments, um, Manon or Steve will come on, ask some questions that you guys have actually um, provided to us, and then you know we'll go back into the different parts of this. Um, Sarah and I had hoped to do this with uh, ten people around a table at, at Oxford at the Skull World Forum, um, but instead uh, we have a lot more people here, and so hopefully we can get the injection of of your brain power. Um, at the end, there'll be a call to action where you can actually sign up uh, to get basically email updates, occasional email updates. This is not, you know, your your uh, sort of fundraising every week kind of kind of list, It'll, but but to keep track of this uh, exciting initiative that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I should note that this session is also affiliated with the Catalyst 2030 um, Coalition, another. Um, crazy uh, collaboration that I think uh, today's world is is bringing together. Um, and so be sure also to keep on the outlook for Catalyst 2030 sessions um, as as we go forward. Um, oh, 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 and I, I have to remember to also say this. Um, so I'm launching a new uh, nonprofit called Tech Matters on Thursday, and there's a session on the Skull World Forum um, sort of, you know, schedule called Why Tech Matters. And that'll be this Thursday. Um, so if you want to hear more about what um, what a, a group of nonprofit oriented nerds in Silicon Valley actually do, um, you can you can uh, look us up that then. So um, so let's see. I'm gonna see you know, I think I I you know Sarah, did I miss anything or do you think about ready to get going? I think we're ready. If you think of anything, just interrupt me and let us know. Okay, take it away, Sarah. Okay, thanks. It, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I was pretty excited to look at the sign-up list for this and see friends and people that I knew and admire here from the west coast of uh, California all the way through Europe and, in, and into Asia. So we appreciate your taking the time to join us. I'm going to uh, take about 20 minutes to try to do two things. Uh, one of them, while I know that many of you are quite expert in landscapes and landscape management, I also know there's others on the call who are not. So I'm going to take the first uh, half, uh, first 10 minutes and just give you the quickie introduction to integrated landscape management so you know really what a thousand landscapes is all about. And then I'll spend the rest of the time telling you about what our vision is and where we are in that process now for a thousand landscapes for a billion people. So let me, let me start with that. First of all, why landscapes? Okay, well, that's interesting. I am not moving. My thing is not moving. Ah, there we go. Okay. Most of you are familiar with the United Nations um, endorsed sustainable development goals in which they're seeing that the future of the world depends on us achieving all of these social, economic, and environmental goals, governance goals, at the same time in an integrated way. And the principle is that we leave no one behind, but we also leave no place behind. Um, which means that every single landscape across the globe needs to be looking at the, achieving these sustainable development goals. And what we know is that landscapes are where these pieces interconnect. We're using the term today to refer to a region whose people and natural resources are linked in a system that shapes by its own distinct ecological, historical, economic, and sociocultural interactions and processes. It can be a watershed, it can be a jurisdiction, it can be a biological corridor, it can be a growth corridor that wants to go into green and inclusive growth. Um, yet while we see this imperative for integration among all these different components in a landscape, the way our institutions are set up right now, our governments, our universities and education systems, our financial systems, 
are set up in a very sectoral way. So we may be part of a large landscape, but the part that's doing farm food production is kind of overseen by the agriculture department and the uh, protected areas are overseen by the Environmental Protection Agency. But in fact, they have so many interconnections that this system of sectoral siloing is really not working for us anymore. And as a result of that, you see movement all across the globe of people because of the reality of the situations they are living and the need to collaborate and coordinate with others to achieve their goals on environment or social goals or their food production goals. Um, they are moving into something that we're calling as an umbrella term integrated landscape management. People say territorial development. I actually have a list of about 92 different words that people use to imply the same kind of collaboration over the long term among different groups of land managers and stakeholders to achieve the full range of goods and services all of the SDGs that you need from the landscape. Let me just give you two quick examples um, of places that we've worked at Eco Agriculture Partners. Uh, one of them was in the north coast of Honduras, which is an area which was the most important center of export agriculture for the country, but also the most important area of both terrestrial and coastal uh, biodiversity. There was enormous growth going on with the expansion of palm oil and all sorts of somewhat uncontrolled expansion of agricultural commodities leading to deforestation, degradation, population growth was extremely high. So all of a sudden a place that had been very rich in resources was experiencing very serious degradation. And a number of years ago, the at farmers organizations, the agribusiness organizations, the environmental organizations, the local governments got together and said, we need to shift the trajectory of growth of this place into a more sustainable direction. And they started a landscape platform to work together. In a very contrasting area in the drylands of Northern Kenya, you had a place where um, you had lots of very uh, vulnerable people with food insecurity and water insecurity at the same time of rapid economic growth and expansion of agriculture going on and yet land degradation was fundamentally undermining the potentials for for irrigation for commercial production this is an area with massive wildlife resources uh, no protected areas it's all, all private conservancies um, and local conservancies, and these were being undermined by the degradation. So in this case, whereas the Honduras case, the facilitator was a nonprofit organization that convened all these groups. In this case, it was the county government, sort of like a provincial government, that pulled together the, the uh, actors to say, how can we achieve food security in our place while reversing land degradation? So these are the kinds of initiatives that I'm talking about. And in fact, these have come all over the world. Uh, eco agriculture partners and a number of research organizations did a series of continental surveys in four parts of the world and came up this was between 2013 and 2016 and came up with 428 of these large landscape initiatives and we've also identified another 50 in the u.s and canada without a, even a full continental review. Australia was one of the earliest places to formally support these kinds of landscape initiatives. And we know there's many others that are arising in East Asia and, and China. And some of the preliminary results of, of self-reported impacts from these landscape initiatives are showing um, very significant impacts, such as uh, in a number of them, 40% of the initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa reported increases in agricultural yields. 87% um, of the initiatives in South and Southeast Asia reported improved biodiversity protection and almost uh, and, and more than uh, half of the landscape initiatives reported in, in Latin America reported empowerment of women. So we really are seeing multiple objectives being met by these stakeholder collaboratives. Um, they have, there's lots of different methodologies and approaches and communities of practice but all of them have basically five key features to them. The first one is collaborative, community-engaged processes for landscape dialogue, negotiation, planning, and action. Secondly, there needs to be a vision, an agreed set of objectives that everyone's moving toward that produces the whole set of benefits in the landscape. 
Thirdly, we need to manage these ecosystems and these the spatial interactions between different land uses and land users, and that needs to be intentional. Uh, fourthly, land uses across the landscape have to be managed to reduce synergies and, I'm sorry, to achieve synergies and to reduce conflicts. And finally, the market systems, the policies, the financial systems need to be aligned with this long-term vision. However, now I move into the discussion about a thousand landscapes for one billion people. Although it's incredibly exciting to watch the evolution and development of these landscape partnerships around the world, they really face some very systemic barriers to regenerating their ecosystems and economies. They have a vision that's so expansive and what they're actually able to accomplish is 10 or 15% of what they're trying to do. Why is that? First of all, because it's actually kind of costly and you need a lot of information to facilitate these landscape scale partnerships, then that's scarce, it's costly and very difficult to access. Secondly, the local stakeholders work hard to negotiate and develop their visions and develop their action plans, and then they're consistently undermined by top-down sectoral development strategies. Um, thirdly, they are very unable to mobilize the level of finance they need for investments at scale across the landscape partly because they're not very good at it, and partly because the financial institutions are not set up to really support that kind of investment. So, we said, let's look, we gotta achieve this sustainable development goals by 2030. We need to see really ramp up the action and make these, these landscape partnerships be much more successful in doing what they wanna do. So our vision and goal is that a thousand large landscapes around the user are using our innovations to unlock regeneration by 2030. And because these are large landscapes, this should benefit a billion people by transforming their economies and ecosystems. We won't do that, they're gonna do that, but we wanna support them in that process. So we've identified four specific interlinked solutions for systems change. Um, and these are being developed as we speak uh, through an intentional process of user-centered design. We're starting with the people who want to use our innovations. So the first area is the development of a digital landscape action platform and the tools associated with that. And in a few minutes, Jim is going to explain to you the process we're using for developing that management tool for landscape partnerships. Secondly is a set of financial system innovations. We don't want to just get more money. We want money to come in a different way. So I'll also talk with you a little bit later about the work we're doing in the design team for that. The third area is developing a thousand landscapes network so that the landscapes and partnerships can interact with one another and also interact with supportive NGO, international NGOs or United Nations agencies or national governments or companies and businesses that can support them. And the fourth one is to, to try to promote and catalyze institutionalizing the capacities that are needed on the ground for successful integrated landscape management. And this whole 1000 Landscapes initiative is going to be governed with landscape partnerships themselves guiding and setting the priorities and directions of the initiative. We're calling this a radical collaboration because we want to see hundreds and hundreds of organizations all around the world aligned to this vision and objectives um, and to work together to add value to the existing landscape initiatives and the really exciting and uh, other sort of landscape programs that are going around. Our design team has more than 30 organizations uh, in it right now. The other uh, sort of co-conspirators leading this work in the design period is Rainforest Alliance, obviously EcoAg and Tech Matters, but also the NGOs Common Land uh, and uh, the Landscape Finance Lab of WWF, Conservation International, and also the United Nations Development Program. So we have a, a diverse set. And this design phase is being supported, we are very grateful, uh, by a number of, of, of uh, funding organizations, the IKEA Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Saul, and, and, and others. Um, and what we're trying to do in this radical collaboration is come up with a common framework for action, an adaptable framework that each landscape can use in their own ways, but that will make it easier for us to all work together in partnership. 
Um, we have we asked people to sign on to these core values of being holistic, catalytic, inclusive, entrepreneurial, and collaborative. And we've actually defined that in much more detailed terms that you can find in our concept note. And we have a trajectory for scaling. We're going to learn and design now between 2019, 2021 and get 10 landscapes testing the platform, start designing the financial innovations and thinking through the organization of the network, then shift to another 100 landscapes in the next few years and get the system to support them in very good shape so that we can then reach out and have 300 landscapes and eventually 1,000 landscapes on the platform, and that we will have financial innovations being catalyzed across the globe that will be supporting them. So I think I'll stop there and see what questions you may have or, or ideas that groups you think we should be talking to to make this vision come to become a reality. In the course of your remarks, Sarah, James had asked, shouldn't we be also be including users in collaborative design? This is the essence of co-creation. We uh, should not just engage management agencies, but also users, including landowners, farmers, residents, and suppliers in the system. James, you are absolutely right. And I think there is a, that, that the uh, picture with all the logos is very faulty because it's actually lacking the about 20 landscape initiatives that have been involved with us in detailed interviews and discussions and sharing with us the um, priorities that they have. And Jim's gonna be talking a little more about that. We will be formalizing a set of landscape partnerships uh, which of course involves the stakeholders within the landscape initiatives also endorsing their participation in a thousand landscapes. So we do want to be respectful of that uh, of that process. But you're absolutely right, and they are central to the design of the of the groups. A lot of the groups with those logos that you saw are helping to introduce us to the landscape leaders in in the actual places who are the ones that are providing the design input. And and Sarah, if I might. Um, you know, we are working with a bunch of big international NGOs who, who have all agreed that this is about reaching grass tops leaders, um, the local landscape leaders, and, and, and sometimes they slip and forget that they've actually <laughs> agreed to that. But, um, but I think what's really quite amazing to me is how this interest in, in acknowledging local autonomy and control and empowering the people who live in the landscapes to actually make these decisions, uh, that, that this is what this collaboration is actually signed up with. And of course, in many cases, they signed up to do so in partnership with people who they often think of as competitors. So I think it's a pretty exciting shift. Um, so uh, do, Steve, do you have another question or Manon? Yeah, actually, I see that there's some curiosity about how the landscapes are selected. So Dajim is wondering about this. And related to that, there is some curiosity about uh, which are the first 10 landscapes. Okay, uh, okay, good. Sarah, would you care to uh, tell us a little bit about how the landscapes are selected sure. first? The first set of landscapes that we've been uh, doing, I mean, we have the Advantage Eco Agriculture Partners has been working since, since 2002 with lately, probably work with more than 60 landscapes around the world and many landscape partnerships. Um, we've also had collaborative arrangements through um, something called the Landscapes for People, Food and Nature Initiative, which was going on between 2011 and still, still ongoing, just wrapping up this year, uh, which was more than 75 organizations around the world that are working in integrated landscape management. So um, many of the, of, of the first set of groups that we've been working with have been have been landscape partners of the initial founding sort of organizations in the design organizations. So each one, some of the learn in the sense of the learning landscapes, we are working now on the learning, um, not yet on the, the selection of the landscapes that will be the first guinea pigs <laughs> for, for working with us in this field. But instead, what we're trying to do is get the highest diversity of land Landscapes. We want some public sector, uh, ones that are led by local governments, ones that are led by regional um, watershed authorities, ones that are led by farmers organizations, ones that are led by indigenous peoples uh, organizations, territorial development initiatives. We're looking for the greatest diversity of, uh, of kinds of users 
So that's how we're selecting the ones that we're working with now. We'll probably end up with 20 or 30 landscape initiatives that are going to be design partners with us. But we then have, in terms of the selection of the 10, um, th there will be some other criteria. Again, we're going to be looking for diversity. Um, we have identified some potential candidates for this, but we want geographic diversity, diversity of agroecosystems in which they're operating, and diverse institutional ones to maximize the learning and make sure that what we're developing is more widely used. So yeah, and I want to, I'll say, uh, when, I, when I talk about um, the design process, I'll talk about the kinds of landscapes that we've already been interviewing and, and how, we, how we've actually gathered that initial set of things. So I'll, we'll expand on that more. Uh, later in the presentation. Yeah. And just one last thing is that it will be global. We expect to have uh, some of the early sets of landscapes to be in you know, hopefully every continent but Antarctica. So. Okay, uh, there's a question about uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, including indigenous peoples, how you avoid marginalization, um, and and sort of how how do you run a landscape initiative to to really be inclusive? Okay, um, let me just start by saying that a thousand landscapes for one billion people is not going to be managing any landscapes. Our role is to add value to those who are managing the landscape, primarily the locally led partnerships, and secondarily the other actors, the NGOs and businesses and others who are working and really committed to helping to, to strengthen those, those local landscape partnerships. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, we actually see this initiative as a way to significantly reduce that marginalization, particularly by raising the voices of indigenous and territorial development initiatives to help them have, make sure they get a, have a place in some of the international and national conversations that are being had uh, through the Thousand Landscapes Network. It's something that's a high priority for the group that's, let's, that's, that's sort of leading the design process. Um, and the way that we're trying to set up, Jim will say a little more about this, but I had a slide I went through pretty fast with looking at the generic the sort of what's the generic process of developing landscape initiatives, the multi-stakeholder platform setup and who, come, who gets involved and what roles do they play in analyzing the landscape together, then leading to a vision and action plan, leading to a financing plan, leading to the implementation and then the impact assessment. And one of the key things is to encourage people and make easy for them, find the tools for them whereby that engagement of indigenous people, marginalized communities as part of a landscape is actually really encouraged and, and they and make much easier for them perhaps uh, by the tools and, and processes that are, that are described and, and, and used in the, in the platform. So that's just, just one example, but it's something that's very much on our minds. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just share. Um, one of the school award winners is the Amazon conservation team um, and they've got years of experience building tools that actually be used by uh, indigenous communities um, in, in South America. And so, uh, so one of the, and I'll come back to this more in my presentation, but one of, one of the things that we, we believe that most of the innovations or almost all the innovations have already been made. And a lot of this is around getting the capital and the knowledge and the information to people so they can learn from each other. And I think that's, that's distinctly true uh, with uh, sort of how, other people have been working together with indigenous communities to empower them. How can we learn from that as we build our tool? Yeah. And I think one of the central features of integrated landscape management is the quality of multi-stakeholder organization, facilitation, communication, um, developing and co-designing the interventions that you want in the landscape. And I think it, it actually should be hopefully in ways that can be very empowering. So. And and maybe the last question before we move on, there, there have actually been six or so questions all around kind of two similar themes. Uh, the change in power sharing that's needed for local landscape alliances to really move forward and how that interacts with land rights and land tenure and, and governments and, and this sharing and transferring power from government to local landscape initiatives, indigenous people, local landowners, smallholder farmers, et cetera. 
It's a, that's a really big question, and I think a very central one that we, we have seen. I think the rise of integrated landscape management and these local landscape partnerships is part of a longer-term global process in many countries of decentralization of power from the center to the, to the sides. But as we're seeing right now in the coronavirus uh, epidemic that we're in, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's a balance between needing central power and needing power to be de decentralized. And how do those two inter interact with one another? And I think one of the things we're trying to do with the Thousand Landscape Network is, is provide a bit of a platform whereby the, 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 the efforts from the center and the efforts from the, the local, local voices can find a way to explicitly negotiate with one another and make sure that they do not want to not overpower um, one another. And I think the land tenure, land rights issues is quite central. There's a set of policy uh, and, you know, basically a set of policies that need to be in place for really successful integrated landscape management. And we're quite far from that. Even in places that have good land tenure, it's typically sector by sector. And it doesn't deal well at all with climate change, where the kinds of lands are moving from one place to the other. And we need to shift the boundaries of our protected areas and change where the farming practices are. We're really not well set up at all. And we're hoping that a thousand landscapes, we're not going to do everything in this initiative, but that it will actually provide a platform for much more systematic discussion and mobilization of action around those issues that have just been discussed. And, 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 and certainly because the landscape initiatives themselves are really going to be in charge of this initiative, um, making sure that their voices and their perspectives are brought into these conversations in a more powerful way, we hope. Okay, so I think that was off to a good start. I know there are more questions, and I think the way that we're operating this, we're going to also have, you know, two other time slots for questions and, and conversation, but I like the, the dynamism that's going on in the chat window, and so looking forward to that. Now, um, so Sarah, I'm going to attempt to share my screen, um, and I've not actually seen your screen being shared, so how are we doing right now? Well, I, I can stop sharing mine and let you try. All right. And if I fail, I'm going to come back to you and say, please. Okay. Oh. Okay. So um, oh, let's see if this works. And now I have to, of course, skip forward to a bunch of slides. That's, uh, ah, sorry about this. I expected to be in the right spot. Every time you close it, it goes back to the beginning, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, so Steve, is uh, am I? One more. There you go. Okay, I'm on it. Great. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of background with you on Tech Sorry, Matters. Sorry, we're in speaker view. Okay, so let's see. All right, let's see if I can. Is that better? Not yet, but not yet. <laughs> okay, let's, okay, let me try. Um, I can do it if you want. You might uh, have to stop share. Yeah. share. Stop sharing and share a different window, yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can do that. That work? Yeah. Yes, it did. Yay! Technology is our friend. Okay, uh, so um, thank you very much again for being part of this. Um, so the, the role that Tech Matters plays is that um, we're Silicon Valley technologists who uh, are organized as a nonprofit, and our goal is to build the tech products uh, for systems change, for social impact, that the regular for-profit Silicon Valley and larger business community just simply won't get around to because they can't make enough money on it. So that's, that's basically the background that we come from. Um, our background in the environmental space is that um, we wrote the Martis, no, sorry, the Marathi uh, project management package for environmentalists about 12, 13 years ago. Um, and so uh, when Sarah and I got together and, and we were talking about her vision for a thousand landscapes, the idea that a tech platform was going to be a piece of that was was definitely on the agenda because in this kind of era, um, making data and software that's actually usable by real people trying to accomplish real objectives 
is is critical. So that's that's the role that we're playing. And um, uh, and Steve, uh, who's alongside me, um, Steve and I first met on the first private enterprise rocket project, uh, which blew up in the launch pad. But that's another story. Um, but Steve and I have worked together off and on on many tech startups, um, including our tech for good efforts in the more, more recent years. And so Steve and I have been doing a lot of interviews of local landscape leaders. And I think this is actually quite key to the lean, agile, human-centered design, these, these, these terms that are, that are buzzwords to a lot of people, but they actually express the way that, that the tech community has shifted in terms of how we build products. Um, and as Anne Mei Chang um, talked about in her book, Lean Impact, uh, it's, it's a very different philosophy that, of how you operate. You don't start with a five-year plan of exactly what you're going to do, and don't, don't tell me that anything is different than I expected it to be. We are actually engaging in a, a human-centered design process where we're interviewing people, and rather than coming to them with a tool that we've already built and say, think is wonderful and try to sell them on it, we're actually saying, how is technology helping the most important things you're working on? How is technology getting in the way? And what would be a miracle? What would be amazing if technology could do? And so we actually take these down as stories. Uh, when we write software, we don't have a detailed technical specification. We have a bunch of stories. And then the co-design process, the co-creation process is we partner with uh, a, a set of users during a development phase before the product is actually ready. And we have them actually test it and say, did we make this story come true? Do we make this story come true 80%? And what is the next 10 or 15% we have to work on? So the beginning of that process is interviewing local leaders. And so we've been in that, in that basic um, zone since November. Um, we kicked this off by a visit to the African Landscape Dialogue in uh, Arusha, Tanzania. Um, and that was a, a group of, I don't know, at least 200 um, local landscape leaders, uh, very, you know, basically almost all local landscape leaders, uh, talking about what they were doing, what was working, how they were using technology, how things were running in the way. And I'll, I'll tell you some of the essences of those conversations. Since that time, um, we've been doing interviews with landscapes all over the world, I'd say, um, uh, with, a, with a heavy emphasis on Africa, uh, Central and South America, Asia, uh, Oceania. Um, uh, we've had a few conversations in more developed landscapes, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, in Spain and California. Um, but I'd say the, the main focus is uh, a range of diversity of landscape types, the kind of landscape developer or, or you know, who, where's the landscape initiative crystallizing around? Is it a, is it a government official? Is it, um, is it someone who's actually been put in place to, to run a landscape initiative by the local stakeholders? Um, or as you heard from Sarah, a wide variety of other people. Um, so we're, we're in the middle of that kind of conversation. And, um, and I think the other thing that, that makes this a compelling combination is, is that not only are we writing software for helping these multi-stakeholder platforms come together, use some best practices around coming up with their action plan, but we're also helping them find the money to actually go to town. And of course, we're here um, in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have tons of partnerships with the impact investing field um, who are complaining and complaining about how they can't find the deals. Uh, I don't think they're looking hard enough, but hey. Um, and of course, one of, our, one of our visions is we want to make it easier to translate between what impact investors and different kinds of capital need and uh, in terms of making commitments and what the local landscape leaders actually need to actually carry forward their, their vision of a more sustainable economy that will serve their community better in the next 10 or 20 years. So, um, so I'm going to just shift to the next screen and hopefully that will, that will operate. Um, <laughs> So, um, so did my next slide come up? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, the we 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 got some loud and clear things. When you show up and say, "Hi, I'm here from Silicon Valley, and I actually want to listen to what you have to say to me about technology," people tell you quite directly some of their issues. And I'd say one of the large issues that that we've heard about 
is data colonialism. I, and not everyone labels it as such, but some people do. Uh, and, you know, this isn't just, um, uh, you know, Facebook owning all of your data or Google. Um, it's also uh, academic institutions, researchers, uh, the national government. Um, a common complaint I heard from quite a number of local landscape leaders is they didn't have the information about their landscape to make better decisions. Um, they knew in many cases that the data was being collected, but they couldn't get their hands on it. And um, I think uh, one of the more um, striking conversations I had with someone from um, Lake Inarisha in, uh, in Kenya, um, in Marisha. And um, uh, he was describing how he felt that his landscape was one of the best studied in the Rift Valley, if not in all of Sub-Saharan Africa, and how he didn't have access to a lot of the data, uh, <laughs> or most of the data, either because people were telling him he had to pay them a lot for it, whether it's paying them for data access or paying $120 to view an article uh, on a big uh, academic website, um, or, uh, or it just simply was they just people weren't willing to share. So I think that there's a strong interest in um, better access to data in what is broadly described as citizen science. So the idea that um, communities can take data collection into their own hands and actually provide access to that data. Um, and so I think that um, I think that this is a, this is a key issue of how can we unlock the potential of this? And you know, the I think I think that tech people are very quick to to focus on geospatial information platforms, um, and there are some real benefits of geospatial. And and frankly, you know, as part of our our outreach, you know, we've probably run into a couple dozen geospatial platforms, each doing something amazing in the geospatial area. But I think we're kind of we were kind of surprised at how a little geospatial information was actually penetrating most of the landscapes that we were talking to, um, and, uh, and that uh, how many of the local community uh, are not comfortable with maps, just maps are not a thing. Um, and so it's, it's good to remember when you come from a heavily technological community like, like, like we do, that just saying, oh, I've got a you know, Esri, ArcInfo, super duper geospatial platform, you know, that works well for international NGOs and some governments, but it doesn't often work. So how do we actually make that accessible is a, is a key part of this issue. But people weren't talking just about geospatial information. Um, there's a ton of interest in measuring more um, data about water um, and the many different ways that we can actually measure water, whether it's uh, soil moisture or river flow gauges or water quality, um, but the list goes on. Um, air quality, um, and air quality is not just an urban issue, um, it's, it's also a, a rural issue. Um, and so, so I think that um, pretty interesting area. So now something that um, you saw Sarah's description of some of our values, it's going to show up in kind of what our default design settings are as we approach this. So we're an open source developer um, and we don't expect to own people's data. We expect to build tools that help them curate and use their own data. And the data that people collect or communities collect or organizations collect, in general, our, our, our belief is that it belongs to them. And that if we're going to use that data, it's gonna be under an explicit data sharing agreement where um, the people who own the data are in the driver's seat in terms of what happens with that. But I think that this area of data collaboration is going to be huge. Um, the next thing is money is a big deal. Um, and uh, you know, many of the landscapes, local landscapes that we're talking to do not have access to large grants or large sums. Um, they're often existing on a shoestring. Um, someone was asking me about um, model forests uh, on the text chat. And you know, we were talking to some model forests who, you know, yeah, we had a big grant and it ran out three years ago and we're still trying to keep the work going but money would be, would be helpful. So I think um, the climate finance section, which will be our, our third set of presentation that Sarah will be talking about, is actually gonna be key. And so how can we actually help people along that? Um, communications is a huge deal. Um, and you know, this is, um, a lot of this is, is not only broadcast information, like how do I help um, my smallholder farmers know more about these tenants of um, climate smart agriculture, 
or how do I get them more access to information about pests or how do I get them access to um, knowing about uh, ecosystem services projects that might actually fund them to do different things. Um, but it's also two-way communications. Um, and I think that this is really an exciting time where it becomes cost effective to actually engage the community and have the community help shape, shape things, whether that's getting active engagement in land use planning uh, or in making, you know, collaborative budget decisions or what it might be. But, but I think that there's, there's some real opportunities there on both sides. And, and you know, right now, um, one of our biggest other projects is building um, crisis contact centers for national child helplines. And this technology is fundamentally under the hood, very similar. And so, so it's a familiar set of things to, to what we need to do. So um, I think the, uh, uh, the last thing I wanted uh, to touch on is that our, our job is to turn all these stories into local, you know, basically into tools that local landscape leaders can use. So let me tell you about the process that we're going to go for, because I know people are asking, how are you selecting people? So right now we're, we're using what's often called the snowball technique, which is, you know, we talk to someone and we say, who else should we talk to? And, and we follow that chain down. Um, we also have had, um, you know, local landscape leaders kind of say, I really want to tell you about what um, we actually need. Um, so I'd say right now we've, we've talked to between 20 and 30 uh, landscape leaders in terms of in, in depth conversations. So Steve's been driving that, that process. And the goal is, is that, af and of course, we're, we're picking people across a wide level of diversity. So both economic diversity, geographic diversity, landscape diversity, uh, sort of organizational and stakeholder platform model diversity. And what we're trying to do is hear enough of common stories, the 20% the of the stories that represent 80% of the value. And then what we'll do is we'll come up with a synthesized roadmap um, for what we're going to develop. Um, and then we're going to feed that roadmap back to the people that we've interviewed and say, did we get this right? Is this on the right track? There is a, a period, and I think, uh, you know, uh, Sarah described it as sort of the 10 landscapes um, that will enter into a co-creation phase with us. Um, this will last six to nine to 12 months, but of course it will never end. But, but it, before we actually declare that we have a version one of this shared platform, and, and that will be um, um, a period where we, we need landscapes that have enough time to actually engage in the testing of the software. Um, and yes, I think there's, there's, I think, small stipend grants to cover the cost of that time because that's time is not free. Um, but I think the idea is that we want people who can actually give us feedback um, that we can then adapt. Now, uh, I want to emphasize, Open source means that when the so as the software is being developed, it'll all be open source. It'll be available at every step of the way, though we won't be representing that it actually works. When the time comes that it releases, it's going to be available to everybody in the world. So, um, so the great thing about open source is there's there's not this idea that you have to pick the winners in your users. It's it's available to everybody. And I'm hoping that um, in partnership with Silicon Valley tech companies and the like, that we can provide not only the open source software, but also a, a basic set of platform services, basically for free or nearly free to as many landscapes in the world as possible. Um, and then of course, we get onto the finance part, which Sarah will be talking about. And so, and, and that's, that's the last thing I want to kind of touch on is the Catalyst 2030 linkage, which is um, Catalyst 2030 is a group of, I don't know, well over 100 social innovators that are coming together around trying to scale up our solutions on the theory that at the current pace we're not we're not reaching the sdgs by 2030 we're not reaching paris by 2050 and so how can we actually accelerate the pace of change so i think that we're talking to a group of people many of whom are also developing technology also developing platforms and the idea is by being open source we can make it much easier to collaborate around these things so that Hopefully, we will stop recreating the wheel over and over again, but actually build some shared assets. And our dream is that when someone comes together in two years to start their own local landscape initiative, that they start with essentially a free toolkit that represents the best practices of their peers all around the world and has the technology and the information and the data in a way that they can actually use and act on to help them bring together a critical mass of local stakeholders develop that action plan for what they want to do, and then help them find the money for doing it. So thanks a lot for, for, for being part of this, and I'm excited to, uh, to answer some questions. 
Great. Uh, the, Danielle posts a question, um, which I think is kind of interesting based upon, and you've touched on this a little bit, but based on the work we did to look at more than 100 tech service providers, there are some very capable platforms out there. I wonder why you'd build new software when there's a lot already out there. Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of platforms out there that solve a lot of particular problems. And I think there are some platforms that are working on things that overlap with what we're doing, but have a slightly different point of view. I think that we are eager to take advantage of APIs and other ways, APIs being a way of technically integrating things. Um, but I think that uh, going out and talking to people, the local landscape leaders, um, we've, we've heard a lot of constructive criticism of the tools that they've actually used. And I think that, um, I, and, I, and I think that we've also run into a lot of proprietary thinking, which is kind of interesting given that most of the people we're talking to are actually nonprofits, but it turns out that sometimes nonprofits are that way. So I think that by being resolutely open source and sharing with other open source platforms, and I think that those are our most natural partnerships, I think we're gonna provide some baseline sets of capabilities that make it possible for people to build things on top of that, things that might be proprietary, and that's fine. I mean, people will be building businesses on top of technical solutions. But, um, but I don't think we found, I think if we'd found exactly what people are asking us for, we would not create, recreate it, um, but we haven't. So, um, so I'd say that's basically the feedback we've been getting. And I don't, Steve, do you have, want to add anything else about sort of what you've been hearing in the interviews? No, no, I think, I think you've covered it well. Okay. Um, and there's a, a question I know is near and dear to your heart, which is about kind of the business model behind all this. Mm -hmm. uh, so Patrick asks, how will the technology solutions be maintained? Will ongoing support be free of cost? Will capacity be enhanced to run the platforms locally? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I would say this is actually um, sort of the Benetech and Tech Matters um, particular expertise. We're generalists, quite frankly, in technology. We, we, we write software for human rights groups and uh, environmental groups and human uh, conservation groups and uh, anti-poverty groups and special education groups, but we're not experts in any of those fields. What we're really quite good at is figuring out how to sustain a technology social enterprise organized as a nonprofit over a 10 to 15 year period. Um, that's actually what product oriented companies actually envisage. Now we're in the nonprofit sector, so we operate on a relative shoestring. And I think this is actually a really key point. Um, if I was starting, if I had a hundred person software company in Silicon Valley, I would be targeting to be like a hundred million dollars a year. In the nonprofit sector, we could be $15 million a year and be making the same level of impact because we don't need to make any profits. We don't have to have those kind of margins. In our work, a one or $2 million a year break-even venture is a gigantic success in the nonprofit sector, even if it was a dismal failure from the standpoint of the for-profit venture capital driven Silicon Valley community. So, um, so as we approach this, um, and, and our background is having started a lot of different successful social enterprises with a lot of different revenue models. Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example of, 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 of a couple quickly. Um, so one is uh, we, we operate the largest digital library for blind and dyslexic people in the world. 95% um, uh, of the budget for this digital platform, um, which has seven or 800,000 users, uh, comes from North America and Europe and Australia and maybe the United Arab Emirates. Um, you know, our biggest user base is in, uh, other than the United States, is in India. Um, and our Indian team said, uh, we want to make this free all throughout South Asia. And we said, well, how are you going to pay for that? And they said, well, it's not going to cost us that much. So we turned it on. And now it's, you know, free in Nepal and Bhutan and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. The, the cost structure of one of these projects is such that you can make those cloud services available for almost nothing. I'd say $10,000 a year. The real cost, and I think this is at the essence of the question is, how do you pay developers to keep the software going? And so we've done this at the 
$300,000 a year level, the million dollar a year level, and the $10 million a year level. And each of those revenue models is different, but it all revolves around the same thing, is that you're funding a, a core team to keep the software going. The amount of money uh, affects how often you get updates and how ambitious uh, the programs are. And because we're open source, um, when someone comes to us and says, I want this set of capabilities, and those capabilities, let's say the majority of them are useful to the rest of the community, we'll say, sure, we'll do that. And we've done that before, for example, in the environmental space where the Nature Conservancy wanted something. We said, well, that costs $100,000. And they gave us $100,000. We built it. And then everyone who used the Marathi tool got the benefit of what TNC had paid for. So the ability to pay for the core technical team, the people who do technical support or training, um, the people who actually do outreach, even for a free and open source product, um, is, is central to how we actually operate these things. And I know that was something of a long answer, but I wanted to make sure to, to tackle that is we have an expectation that we will find that. And if it needs to be 50% paid for by philanthropy and 50% paid for by landscapes in the developed part of the world, that, that works for us. Steve, do we have another question? Sorry, I was remuted. Uh -huh. uh, Jerry asks, uh, how are you analyzing the stories? As a sociologist, I'm interested in the methods you use to analyze the patterns emerging from the conversations. And as, as the one who's done much of this, I, I have to confess, Jerry, that, that we don't have a very scientific process. So it's possible that your own sociological training would inform it. However, at this point, we have a small enough number of, of interviews that basically it's a process of rereading and re-listening and, and just trying to pick out those common threads um, and, and synthesize them into user stories and, it, and then use the feedback loop going back to the, the interviewees to make sure we've heard what they said and to, and to cross fertilize. So things we heard from one interviewee, we can present to, the, to other people that we're talking to and, and maybe stimulate further thought and creativity. And through that iteration, really try to, to, to grow this set of stories into something that, that people say, wow, yeah, no, if you could do that, that really would help. When, when they start out thinking technology, no, nah, I don't think technology really, you know, you know, the, the initial reaction is, um, I don't think software would really help us. And it's only after you start to, to sort of feed those juices oh, that they get very creative. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll go further. I mean, right now, we're trying to come up with a rough enough roadmap that we can actually build prototypes and put it in front of people. But while we're in the actual software development period, you know, we have structured interviews and questionnaires or we'll show them a video of how it might work and we get their feedback on how this actually works and and we feedback and then we do bring in um, user experience human-centered design professionals to actually help us prototype further so we have another project that's about let's say 10 or 11 months further along and we're right in the middle of this so so and it's, but yes um we we are always operating on a shoestring so getting expertise is always interesting so, so one thing, if I could just add, please, Sarah, I'm trying to put in place, this is also part of the design process, um, 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 a monitoring and learning process from this whole um, set of activities, um, building that together with the landscape so that we can track what we're learning, what we're not learning, what are the questions, and sharing that broadly through the community. Yeah. So I think, Steve, we probably should... Yes. Are you wrapping up this segment? Uh, do we have a final question? or uh, do I think we should move on based okay. on our time frame. Okay. Sarah, can you take back uh, the screen and take us to the next segment? I will take back the screen. Let's see if I can find uh, myself getting that screen. Uh, here it is. This time it was on the bottom instead of on the top. And you'll have to uh, forgive me for a second because it's going to take a little bit of time for me to um, so, um, okay, from the current slide, let's see if this works. All right. Maybe. You have it? Maybe one more. I'm seeing questions or ideas. I know, and I'm pushing hard on that little button and seeing why it's not going, I don't know. There we go. Okay. 
Um, yes. So if you will remember from my head of my little circle diagram in the previous presentation, uh, this was the process of building the multi-stakeholder platform, doing the understanding of the landscape in a shared way, going to action and, and the vision and the action plan. And let me say that in many landscapes, that's where they stop. They jump from action to, okay, everybody, let's do what you say that you're going to do. You company that you're going to put in water filtration systems, you'll do that. And you cocoa farmers are going to shift to, you know, agroforestry systems. And you folks over there are going to build the, you local governments are going to build natural infrastructure to, to manage biodiversity in, in and around your towns. Um, we're going to be putting in sustainable energy activities. Um, all of those things are the building blocks of a sustainable landscape. Um, but what people tend to do is not move from action design to the financing of how they're actually going to make that happen, perhaps particularly how they're going to make that happen at scale. Um, so if we're going to shift to an inclusive green economy in the landscape, we, the action plan needs to be translated into uh, an investable uh, project in a pipeline, a continuous pipeline of new investments. And those are commercial investments blended finance, mixed commercial and public. Uh, they may be public sector investments. They may be NGO investments, uh, farmer cooperative investments, protected area management investments, et cetera, that are, if you'll recall, aligned so that if they're all implemented together, you will get this transformation at the landscape scale. Um, but the, so the first challenge for financing is actually to have a high quality set of investable projects. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is the suitable type of finance. There's a craziness going on in the world of landscapes today where people are getting finance from really, you know, from equity investors to do technical assistance and from NGOs to do equity finance just because the system is in such difficult shape. So you need suitable types of finance is the second component of a system for landscape finance. And the third piece that we need is a mechanism for that coordination and integration so that as finance flows, the system as a whole across the landscape actually becomes more sustainable. It's not so helpful if you fix the forestry sector, but the ag sector is still really lagging behind because then if you look at the whole watershed, you can't actually achieve your watershed objectives or your biological corridor objectives or your climate, um, your climate uh, mitigation and adaptation objectives. People need, they need to be moved on along. So one of the core issues for integrated landscape finance is this function of coordination. And we've actually done a scoping exercise over the last year with a lot of partners from the Coalition for Private Investment in, in Conservation, uh, the design partners of the finance design team of a thousand landscapes and others who've contributed to this to identify what are the innovations out there that are achieving this landscape finance system, this pipeline of investable landscape friendly pr projects, the suitable kinds of finance and, uh, and the coordination across the landscape. And we've identified two sets of innovations that we're trying to understand and study and develop further. The first one is what we're calling sort of landscape investment service providers. These are groups that help the landscape partnership move through the action planning process, the design of landscape friendly investments if they need that help, um, and on to the designing of financing plans. How do they find the right actors in the landscape and then actually mobilize the financing for them? And there's four different types of service providers that we've identified. Um, one of them is that the landscape partnerships itself steps up and they bring in finance people into their stakeholder platform. They find the expertise locally and they actually do this work. You see this example with some of the local governments that develop basically a sustainable economic development, you know, arm that supports the landscape partnership. Um, or you'll see it with some, some examples of, uh, of NGOs that build this capacity within them to, to provide the service in their landscape. Uh, a second one is you see uh, what we're calling a sort of a landscape portfolio developer, which is an external nonprofit organization which offers its services to a landscape partnership. So, for example, that Honduras case that I was showing you before, uh, the international NGO Solidaridad was providing the service to the landscape partnership and had, had, their, had financial experts who understood landscapes 
who could come in and advise and support this process. Um, the also, you have several of our uh, partners, Conservation International, the World Wildlife Fund, Common Land, uh, Rainforest Alliance are nonprofits who, who play this role. The United Nations Development Program has one of the largest portfolios of supporting landscape partnerships in the world. They work more through government agencies, but they play that role. Um, the third model we found was a land, we call a landscape development company. And these are actually very new. They're just really the last few years where people who have this mixed expertise of landscape development and finance and business development, entrepreneurship, come to offer those services for a fee. Uh, and there's a variety of kinds of financing models. Uh, sometimes they also co-invest in some of the specific investments that come up or the companies that get developed. That's a very new model. Uh, the Fiji Investment Partnership has been supported by, um, by WWF to become such a, such a for-profit entity. Um, and then the fourth one is, type that we've observed is some specialized groups that don't do the whole process of investment support to the partnership, but they help with the transition of those, the particularly private sector businesses that they've got an action, they're gonna become much more landscape friendly, uh, how do they develop their business plans? How do they do their design, et cetera, moving them to a financing plan? But they have a really strong landscape lens. So an example of that is, is BirdLife's uh, Forest Accelerator that, that supports those kinds of, of, of really landscape-friendly business um, developments. The other set of solutions to this question about integrating uh, and co coordinating the, the whole financing strategy is to actually have large pools of capital, of, 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 of money, that, be, that are made available for a portfolio of coordinated multi-sector, multi-project investments. In other words, the kind of things you need in the landscape. Not for everything, but maybe for some real set of real anchor investments. And we've also seen an enormous amount of innovation in this field. Um, we've seen a number of initiatives to develop a large investment fund focused on funding activities in a single landscape. So for example, the Marisha Naivasha group that Jim was referring to before in Kenya is working on the development of, of a fund for this. Um, in the United States, uh, Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts developed an investment fund for, for that landscape. The second one are bigger investment funds, again, much larger pools of capital potentially that support activities in multiple landscapes. Um, and so there's a number of these that you may, some of you may be familiar with the Althelia Climate Fund. Some of their investments are really landscape, integrated landscape investments. The Livelihoods Fund, which has more of a climate focus, but they invest across a range of activities in the landscape to achieve agricultural smallholder farmer benefits, as well as climate benefits and watershed management benefits. There's a third type. We've only found a few examples of this but where you have groups of people with a lot of money, high net worth individuals or investment companies that come together and say, we will, we've agreed, we as a collective will support investments across this landscape. Um, so uh, we have, for example, Encourage Community Foundation in Wisconsin in the US has done this. Um, a fourth one is more, I would say conceptual we have models that we can build in, but we don't quite have the models in place in, a real, in the real world. Um, and this is landscape development finance institutions. So some of this is, uh, one of the best examples is the European Investment Bank, which has probably done the most work on sustainability investments in general. But they have some of their uh, investment portfolios that are specifically focused on landscape investments, such as in Athens, Greece where they're supporting the whole sustainable development strategy of the city of Athens and its environment. Um, you also have the, the model we have in the United States of community development finance institutions, which are a great, they're just like a landscape development finance institution, except they almost never invest in natural resources, ecosystems, or agriculture. <laughs> so if those could integrate them, they could actually become a model. And finally, there's the concept of landscape bonds. We've only really found one in Kasagao Corridor in Kenya, that really is an integrated landscape bond, but it certainly has a lot, of, a lot of potentials. So anyway, there's a lot of innovation going on. What we're trying to do in the landscape finance design team of 1,000 Landscapes 
is to catalyze and refine some of these new landscape investment vehicles, really be able to move large pools of funds to disaggregated local investment priorities. We want, we're trying to model the landscape finance impacts to try to have a much, more, much stronger case to make with the financial institutions about why this is actually a good business uh, move for them. Um, we're working to design a thousand landscapes transformation fund that will support what will be a model for supporting landscape initiatives to do the not the grant based work that they need to do. Uh, we're working on refining a toolkit that will help landscape partnerships themselves who want to take on those roles to move through that process in a more systematic way. And finally, um, we're uh, working to partner with financial institutions around the world so that they will lead within their own community an action agenda to shift financing to be more supportive of landscapes. So I think I'll stop there. That any? sounds great, Sarah. And I know that we're, we're down to our, basically our last 20 minutes, which is a session for Q&A. So we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A and then we'll have two or three minutes of wrap up. But um, I know uh, I was watching a Slack channel and the chat channel, and so I know there's a lot of great questions out there. Who's asking the question on behalf of the, uh, the assembled folks? Do you want to proceed, Manon, or do you want me to bring the ones I've Yeah, actually, I saw one which I thought was rather interesting. Um, so for uh, smaller landscapes, such as the small island developing states, mm -hmm. um, how would you see the particip participation in this initiative given the small size of these landscapes? Like, would it be possible to work through sub-regional landscape approaches, for example? I'm sorry, through, through what was that, Manon? Uh, sub-regional landscape approaches. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the idea of the landscape and how big it is, is um, we actually spent two years, almost 20 years ago, with a big high level group of scientists to de determine what the size should be. And in the end, we said the size needs to be the size that it needs to be in order to solve the problems that people have. So some landscapes are relatively small um, because you can resolve the issues at that scale. Other ones need to be much larger. Um, but there's certainly no reason. I think in, in the case of some of the small developed, the, uh, like the island nations, and, and we have certainly seen some examples of this, it's almost like the whole, the whole island becomes the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then if you, have the govern, if you have actually government entities that are leading that landscape, sometimes those would actually get merged into a sustainable development, a sustainable growth strategy for the, the island as a whole. If you don't have a, a, a lead, um, government agency that would play that role uh, than a local local um, uh, university, uh, a local NGO, uh, whatever kind of local convening, a local business group, maybe the one that catalyzes the multi-sector collaboration to move forward in terms of that development. But there's really no, um, there's no constraint whatsoever. Obviously, the, the level of, of financing that you need to get is sometimes smaller with a, with a smaller, with a smaller area and a smaller population. But I think people underestimate just how large an investment is required to make these landscapes sustainable. It's, it's more than people think. Um, fortunately, the good thing is, it's not necessarily a lot of new money. Some of it is about taking the existing money for infrastructure, the existing money invested in agriculture, the existing money, and actually shifting the way that those funds are deployed and how they coordinate with other, other sorts, of, sorts of funds to be able to move in the same direction. So, it can be, you know, large landscapes, it's billions of dollars towards sustainable investment. However, at the level of what you can do through these partnerships, it's really focusing on the catalytic investments that will help shift other money to go into the right directions. So I think SIDS is... Yeah, and I think, I think that, you know, by uh, interviewing Fiji and certain islands and mm -hmm. the Indonesian archipelago, we're, we're trying to, ex you know, have, hear stories from landscapes where the marine component or the coral reef component is a very important part of their landscape planning as opposed to you know whether it's a model forest or more of a dry land ag kind of kind of landscape we're trying to get that full range so that we can identify some of the particular needs of certain types of landscapes mm -hmm. and you've named one particular type that we've already thought about but you know is Fiji the right analogy uh, partly, but not perfectly, right? So, mm -hmm. so Steve or Manon, uh, another question. 
Um, yeah, I also see a lot of people wondering uh, if you could give a bit more information about the role of the governments in the approach, uh, considering that the governments do still finance and manage these uh, landscape restoration efforts. Um, so to make sure that the approaches are being accepted by the local government systems. Sure. No, there's been a really exciting shift, I would say, in the many decades that I've been working in this space, uh, that a lot of the early landscape initiatives were almost, because of that, those siloed approach that I was talking about at the beginning of my first talk, um, it, it, they, the governments were not responding. There was this huge urgency to do biodiversity conservation together with agricultural development, and no one was doing it. So you have this mo mobilization by civil society uh, to take a leadership role in trying to form these multi-stakeholder partnerships. I would say that in, that's still the case in some parts of the world, but it's changed quite dramatically. And there are now many more of these local governments that find that a perfectly natural and normal tr thing to do. They don't always have the skills or the training of staff to be able to do it really well, but there, you don't have the resistance that you used to, you used to get in, in some of these places. So I think the role of, of local governments is really important. I would say, however, that I think it's actually not true that government action is going to lead restoration. Restoration needs to happen on public lands, it needs to happen on private lands, it needs to happen on production lands, it needs to happen in schoolyards, yes, but it also needs to happen in the areas around military bases and it needs to happen all over the landscape. And therefore that cannot be done by the governments. Governments have need to be saving their funds for those places where there's no other actor that can restore those places. And maybe philanthropies can come in to even do some of those. So the role of government in, in assisting with the coordination and supporting these multi-stakeholder efforts is really critical. But I think we're making a big mistake if we think restoration is gonna happen through public funding and by public, public sectors working alone. It's really the other sectors that need to step up to the plate, do what they need to do, and they need those models that will show how they can continue to achieve their other objectives while they achieve restoration. Um, so I think the, the role we, in the, that survey of 428 landscapes that we did, I think 95% of them had government partners in the landscapes and maybe 30% of them had government agencies leading or facilitating the landscape initiatives. Um, so I think that, that part's really critical, but this is an all hands on deck challenge if we're gonna meet these SDGs by the 2030, it can't be left to, to governments alone. Yeah, and I think this is a very familiar path for a lot of the experienced social entrepreneurs. We often get started to remedy government failures. Um, and eventually, if we want to get to full on systems change at scale, uh, we often find ourselves having to partner with government because that's the way you get to that kind of a scale. And so, all right, another question. Yes, it was hard to choose from so many good questions. Um, <laughs> but there's one which is based on measuring the impact. Um, let me phrase the question. Um, are there any shared reporting tools based on common indicators that should be measured by the different landscape initiatives? Or is each project free to decide how they will monitor change over time? So um, that's a really great question and a very central thing. I, when Eco Agriculture Partners had our very, very first conference in Africa in 2004, and we brought together 250 landscape leaders from all around, there were 66 countries or something like that. We said, what's the number one thing you need? And the number one thing they needed was impact assessment metrics. <laughs> and it's a little frustrating to realize that we're, we're here in 2020 and we don't yet have them. However, there's some really wonderful work going on. We are collaborating with Landscale, which is in itself a collaborative initiative trying to look at assessment metrics for, for, for landscapes that would be systematically looking at the full range of functions that landscapes do um, in terms of, it, of, of whether it's the SDGs or whatever configuration. The approach that we've been taking at Eco Agriculture Partners, um, and let, let me just say that this is very much part of the design challenge that we face right now. We're just getting into the juicy conversations about how we're going to handle metrics on the, on the platform. But I think the direction in which we're heading is having a framework which has the different elements that makes it easy for landscape initiatives to think about, triggers them to think about 
what they want to measure and who they're measuring it for. Who's the audience? We consider the primary audience to be the partnership itself. So it can keep itself moving in the directions that it's laid out as its objectives. And then secondarily, reporting to other kinds of actors. But I think we want to try to provide a framework. We want to provide a set of tools that they could use. We want to provide suggested indicators and metrics. But we do think it's very important for the individual landscape within that framework to decide what's really important for them to measure and to use the tools that would be sensible for the audiences that they have. Yeah. And I and I think I mean just to, to just expand on that. I mean, th th this is going to be an open source platform. So in theory, people can do anything they darn well please, mm -hmm. and because we're not the you know uh, metric police, right? But at the same time, uh, there is the power of the default, right? Which is well, if you don't have any idea, other landscapes like yours have found these metrics to be actually useful. Or and and then we have to be we have to be open to the fact that. There are funders who require certain kinds of metrics, or there are programs to, where if you're going to access this funding stream, you must do these things. And, you know, I think there's been quite a number of landscapes will say, if I get that kind of a funding stream, I will sign up for those metrics, even if they aren't necessarily the first metric I would think of. And so this balancing act between the sort of top down funder and or government centric metric approach and the bottoms up what is it that's most important to your community uh, we have to support both of those structures yeah. and i think it's i think one of the things that's been fun about this just this whole design process is is the systematically learning from the innovations that are going on around the world and i had a wonderful conversation recently with the country of el salvador in central america it's a small country but they've actually taken on landscapes sustainable landscapes as a as a fundamental organizing principle for their for their development program mm -hmm. in, in in el salvador and they've actually just started to put in place a set of com integrated metrics between what's being generated by the landscapes and the system that the national government is using for metrics it's actually the only case i've seen of this so far and they're they're still working it out but it's, it's quite fascinating because it means that landscapes will be getting some more support for this process from the government, that the government is asking them to do metrics that actually matter to them as a landscape and that the information coming out of it is, is actually meaningful from a sustainable, integrated sustainable development. Sounds great. So we're down to our last five minutes of questions. So let's see if we can squeeze one or two more in. So who's got the next question? I'll go ahead and, and ask a question that Anna asked very early on in the in the presentation, but I think it is kind of central to the, the point of these landscape initiatives. And asks, you mentioned one key feature of most approaches is to agree on a set of objectives that everyone is moving towards. How do you facilitate such agreement, particularly in circumstances where there's difficult trade-offs between social and environmental objectives? Mm -hmm. I would be happy to talk about that because I think that is the center of these initiatives. This is not just adding A and B and C and D to come up with some sort of a set of activities that you want to do in the landscape. It's, it's about fundamentally having different actors understand the challenges and opportunities of other actors in the landscape, staying true to the things that are th their genuine interests. I mean, businesses actually do have to make money and food, food processors actually need to get sources of, of, of food. Um, but by, uh, we, we put a lot of emphasis on um, the early stages, at least when we recommend, people obviously do whatever they wanna do, but I think what we've observed to be successful is when enough time is invested early in the process for people to develop a shared understanding and a shared analysis of what's going on in the landscape. If you just bring in an expert consultant who does a landscape analysis for you, you will not get that learning. You need to have people go to the field together and explain to one another why the thing they are doing up in their oil palm plantation and showing them where it goes into the coral reef and why that coral reef is so critical for the fisheries and treating them not, not, not denying the potential conflict but turning it from a, a, a shared problem and a shared set of solutions. And it's actually, I think it's just in the human nature that as people better understand and develop relationships and start to build relationships of at least, at least a respect, if not trust, for groups with whom they may not have been agreeing in the past, they come up with innovative ways of solving the problem. 
Not to say you can do it always, but sometimes a problem that can't be solved in a farm field can be solved in a community. Or if it can't be solved at the community scale, it can be solved at a landscape scale. And maybe actors will compensate losers because they're losing, quote unquote, on behalf of the whole community. And so maybe they get something else out of it that wasn't in the original frame. So I think there's a lot of really, really good, a um, lot of knowledge about how to run and manage multi-stakeholder processes, a lot of knowledge about how to generate those kinds of shared solutions. Um, so that's something that actually that's no, know how to do. It's just that there aren't a lot of people trained to do that. Um, but it's very powerful when you see it. Yeah, and I, I think the other observation I'd make is, you know, as a technologist, um, I have to be clear that often technology is not the heart of some of these processes. Um, so a lot of this multi-stakeholder platform where you bring people around the table, these are human processes. When you look at the tools that people talk about, uh, this was kind of a surprise to me, they're often talking about a, you know, a 40 page, you know, moderator's manual on how to convene and bring competing interests around a table and actually have these conversations that aren't, that need to be had or optimally would be had, but haven't been having before. And so in many cases, we're not expecting to automate these processes because they're actually, they're human processes, but more semi-automate and support them. So I know, I know we're down to the last uh, minute or two, Sarah, you might want to advance the slide, because I think we may have more of a, uh, uh, maybe even a wrap-up, great, a wrap-up slide. Um, is there a quick question we can answer, or do you think we should go to the wrap, Steve? I think we should go to wrap. Okay, so I wanted to thank, on behalf of the Thousand Landscapes for One Billion People partnership, this radical collaboration, I want to thank the Skull World Forum for giving us an opportunity to have this presentation today. I want to thank you for investing the time in this era of a global pandemic uh, to come around at a virtual conference and talk about these issues that are pervasive and our long term that we need to be paying attention to now, even though maybe today's crisis has us worried more about how we're going to get food and whether our family members are actually all healthy. So as we as we wrap up, um, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah for her closing remarks, and then I will just tie it off at the very end. So Sarah, take it away. Give us a call to action. Sure. Well, I first do want to thank people. I haven't had a chance to read all the chats, but I can't wait to do so. I'm really looking forward for you for your input in this. I think if one thing the pandemic does show us is the degree of global interdependence that we have with one another, showing the links between our food systems, our, our ecosystems, our health systems, and that we, we need, to be, need to be working closer in this. So I think that the uh, agenda here uh, for meeting the sustainable development goals, for meeting the post-2020 biodiversity goals, meeting the land restoration uh, goals, um, sustainable food systems goals is going to require, uh, I think the, the landscapes piece is part of a pretty significant part of that solution, um, we think. We'd love to have you join us. We are just in the design phase. We're not ready to do lots of things with lots of people yet, um, but we invite you to, first of all, to sign up at our very minimalist uh, current website. Um, we are in the process of putting together a nice website for everybody, but you can sign up to receive regular um, e updates about what we're doing. And we will be trying to build a communications platform uh, to, to stay in contact with everybody. There will be an opportunity in the future to join the Thousand Landscape Networks as, as soon as that gets set up, but there's a bit of design left to do that. We will, in the very short term, uh, do promise you that by next week, we will send a mailing to all of you who signed up for this event um, with a copy of the recording, um, which you are welcome to share. It will be open and it'll be on all of our websites of all the, the partner organizations of the Thousand Landscapes. Uh, we'll also give you a copy of the PowerPoint so, so that you can see what those look like um, and a copy of the results of the chat boxes, I believe. Yeah, I think we can do that as well. I see. Please continue to send us your ideas. We do want to build this radical collaboration and we don't want to be reinventing any wheels. We don't need to. So um, if you can send it, we we'll invite you right now, Eco Agriculture Partners is the convening organization for the 1000 Landscapes. Um, and so we can help make sure that your questions and your comments get to the right people within the partnership. And we, we very much welcome that. So I think um, we would, I, some of you are doing the, real, the work on the ground. We congratulate you for the amazing work that you're doing. And I think it's pretty exciting to know that there's actually a whole cohort of people all around the world that are trying to do the same things as you are. Um, and we'd especially would love to hear from you. 
And as Sarah points out, Eco Agriculture Partners is the point person for the Thousand Landscapes Initiative. But um, I have a session on Thursday. I know some of you said, how do I get to talk more to Jim? Uh, it'll be a session just on tech matters and how to do technology for social good, both in the landscape context, but in other contexts. So please join, it's called Why Tech Matters. And I think the link has been on the chat, chat links. So anyway, thank you again for your time and for your collective work on dealing with some of the world's biggest challenges. And we can't imagine more bigger challenges than working on landscape restoration for a billion people. Thank you very much. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you, Stephen Manone. <laughs> you bet. We're